Hey guys, welcome back to the classroom for week nine of distance learning. Um, I'm just gonna go through our list of announcements and instructions for the work, and then I'll jump right back into the refugee novel. Um, and if you were listening last week, you know that something kind of crazy happened, so we'll have to see how it turns out. Um, so this week, actually, let's talk about last week real quick. Um, the discussion questions are sort of an issue for some of you guys because I realized that if you're if the people in your group do not respond or don't post a, a response, then you can't reply to it. So what I'm going to do is we're going to scratch that um, for the rest of the weeks and that we have left, which is just three more weeks. And I'll just have you guys be completing work by yourself because some of your classmates are not doing the work in a timely manner. That means that you have to wait until the last minute to do the answer. So we just won't do that. So what we'll be doing this week is obviously you're going to keep reading your novel chapters. Um, then, so you're going to have a quick write that's going to be another little creative prompt where I'll show you guys kind of a fun picture and you'll just write me a few sentences on what you think is happening. Um, that's going to be part of grade one. The other part of grade one is there's going to be an online quizzes. So just like we did in the classroom and it's going to be based on vocabulary from the book that you are reading. So if you're reading um, Freak the Mighty, you're gonna click on the quizzes for Freak the Mighty. That's the only one you have to do. If you're reading Holes, you only click on the one for Holes. Um, <clears throat> the vocabulary quizzes, you, they are untimed basically. So as you're going through each question and it asks you, what do you think this word from the book means? you can look up the definition on the internet. It's not a guessing game. If you don't know what it means, that's your opportunity to take a minute and look it up and see what see what the word means, okay? Um, you will be able to take it multiple times if you don't get a good grade, but since you're gonna be able to look up the answers as you're doing it, you should be fine, okay? And then the last thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna pick one word from the book that wasn't in the quiz that you didn't know the meaning of and you'll just put the word uh, on a Google Slides and then you'll have, um, you'll look up the definition and then you'll put it in a sentence. So your three grades, well it's two grades, but your three assignments for this week are gonna be the quick rate, they're gonna be the quizzes, and then the vocabulary search, which is just one word. So it should only take like two or three minutes for you to do. Just like last week, I will have an optional check-in at the end. So if you wanna tell me about what you've been up to and you wanna update me, um, that would be awesome and I'll reply to it, but it's just gonna be optional because I know you guys have a lot of work from your other teachers too. So if you don't and you're like, I just wanna do the work and turn it in, that's fine too, okay? Um, I wanted to congratulate my first period again because you guys are leading the pack for our averages. You guys consistently have an A average, class average across the board, which is amazing. Um, and so I just wanna ask all of you guys, hopefully to get to that point, um, especially fifth and seventh period, you guys could be doing a lot better. So I'd really like to see you guys bring up those grades. So we have three weeks left to bring those up. I should go ahead and tell you guys that we are meeting as um, a department and as sixth grade to talk about, hey, you know, this is the student that, you know, maybe this student would benefit from summer school. Maybe this student would benefit from like a little extra time, um, you know, in the sixth grade or whatever. So I do wanna make sure you guys know that these grades do count. And if you're not giving me what you think demonstrates your best ability you have three weeks to bring up your grade like this is this is enough time for you guys to be doing better than you than you did so just as a heads up that's going to be coming up and some of you guys might be getting some parent phone calls where we just want to check in and say hey like i really don't think that bobby needs to have an f because bobby's an a and b student so just kind of be on the lookout for that um what did I do this week? I actually, um, well, I've been working in my garden a lot, and so I, I picked this flower to show you guys. It's from my basil plant. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, so that's kind of cool, because it's also like edible, so you can eat it. Um, pretty tasty. Not the flowers, just the basil leaves. And then also, a few years ago, my parents gave me this um, bird guide. So I've been bird watching in my backyard and I actually used it to identify, we have this owl in our neighborhood and I used it to identify um, this guy right here, the barred owl. So if you hear like an owl outside your window, that might be it. That'd be kind of cool. Um, all right. So I think that's it for this week. I'm about to read the novel, but I do want to say again, guys, as always, I'm super proud of those of you who are continuing to do your best despite the circumstances. I really wish we were back in the classroom together. I really miss you guys. 
Um, but I think that you're doing an amazing job. So let's just make sure that your work this week reflects your ability um, because I really don't want to see you guys fall behind in the last three weeks of school. Okay, so keep it up and here's the novel. And as always, Mars is here to remind you guys to do your work this week. Right, bud? Okay. Isabel, somewhere between the Bahamas and Florida, 1994, five days from home. The night sky was so clear Isabel could see the Milky Way. Her gaze was on the stars, but she wasn't really looking at them. She wasn't really looking at anything. Her eyes were blurry from tears. Next to her, Senora Castillo sobbed in her husband's arms, her shoulders heaving. Like Isabel, she had been crying ever since Yvonne died. Senor Castillo stared out over his wife's head, his eyes vacant. Luis kicked at the silent engine, rattling the bolts that held it down. He buried his face in his hands, and Amara hugged him tight. Yvonne was dead. Isabel couldn't grasp it. One minute he had been alive, talking to them, laughing with them, and the next he was dead, lifeless, like every other Cuban who had ever died trying to get to El Norte by sea. But Yvonne wasn't some nameless, faceless person. He was Yvonne, her Yvonne. He was her friend, and he was dead. Isabel's eyes drifted down to where Yvonne's body lay, but she still didn't look right at him. Couldn't. Even though Poppy had taken down the shirt he draped over Mommy to shade her and laid it across Yvonne's face, Isabel couldn't bear to look. She knew Yvonne's face, his smile. She wanted to think of him that way. Lido sang a low, sad song, and Isabel retreated into the arms of her mother and father. The three of them huddled together as if what happened to Yvonne might happen to them too if they came too close to his body. But the real threat was the sinking boat and the sharks that still circled it, following the trail of bloody water that started at Isabel's feet. Fidel Castro had Yvonne's blood all over him. Isabel remembered the wake for her grandmother. It had been a quiet, somber occasion. There had been a body to bury. There hadn't even been a body to bury. Those who had come and spent most of their time comforting Lido and Mommy and Isabel, hugging them and kissing them and sharing their grief. Isabel knew she could do that now for the Castillos, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. How could she comfort the Castillos when she still needed comforting herself? Ivan was their son, their brother, but he was Isabel's best friend. In some ways, she knew him better than even his family did. She'd played soccer with him in the alley, swum with him in the sea, sat next to him in school. She'd eaten dinner at his house and he at hers so many times that they might as well have been brother and sister. Isabel and Yvonne had grown up together. She couldn't imagine a world where she would run next door and he wouldn't be there. But Yvonne wouldn't be coming over anymore because Yvonne was dead. The loss of him ached like a part of Isabel was suddenly missing, like her heart had been ripped out of her chest and all that was left was a giant gaping hole. She shook again as her body was racked with sobs and mommy pulled her closer. After a time, Isabel's grandfather finally spoke. We need to do something, he said, with the body. Senor Castillo wailed, but Senor Castillo nodded. Do something with the body? Isabel looked around. But what was there to be done with Yvonne's body on this little raft? And then Isabel understood. There was only one place for Yvonne's body to go, into the sea. The thought made her recoil in terror. No, no, we can't leave him here, Isabel cried. He'll be all alone. Yvonne never liked to be alone. Lido nodded to Isabel's father, and the two of them stood to lift Yvonne out of the small boat. Isabel fought to get free of her mother, but Mommy held her tight. Wait, Senora Castillo said. She pulled herself away from her husband, her face streaked with tears. We have to say something, a prayer, something. I want God to know Ivan is coming. Isabel had never been to church. When Castro and the communists had taken over, they had discouraged the practice of religion. But Spanish Catholics had conquered the island long before Castro had, and Isabel knew their religion was still there, deep down, the way Lido told her clave was buried beneath the audible rhythms of, of a song. Lido was the oldest and had been to the most funerals, so he took charge. He made the sign of the cross over Ivan's body and said, Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. Senora Castillo nodded, and Lido and Isabel's father picked up Ivan's body. No, no, Isabel cried. She reached out as if to stop them, then pulled her hands back and clasped them to her chest. She knew they had to do this, that they could not keep Ivan on the boat with them, not like this. But as she watched Lido and Poppy lift up Yvonne's body, the empty place inside got bigger and bigger until she was more empty than full. She wished she was dead too. She wished she was dead so they would put her into the water with Yvonne so she could keep him company in the deep. Senora Castilla reached out and took her son's hand one last time and Luis stood and put a hand to Yvonne's chest, one last connection to his brother before he was gone for good. Isabel wanted to do something, to say something, but she was too overcome for, with grief. Wait, Luis said. He pulled his pistol from the holster. His face turned mean as he aimed it over the side of the boat at one of the fins that skimmed the surface. Isabel was ready for the shots this time, but they still made her jump. Bang, bang, bang. The shark died in a bloody, thrashing spasm, and the other sharks that had been following the boat fell on it in a frenzy. 
Luis nodded to Lido and Isabel's father, and Sierra Castillo looked away as they slipped Ivan off the other side of the boat, away from the sharks, where he sank into the Black Sea. No one spoke. Isabel cried, the tears coming without end, flowing up from the hollow place in her chest that threatened to consume her. Ivan was gone, forever. Isabel suddenly remembered Ivan's industriales cap. Where was it? What had happened to it? It hadn't been on him when he'd been put into the water, and Isabel wanted to find it, needed to find it. There was something she could do. A piece of him that she could keep close to her. She pulled away from her mother and searched the little boat for it. It had to be somewhere. Yes, there, floating upside down in the bloody water underneath one of the benches. She plucked it up and held it to her chest, the only part of Yvonne she had left. I wanted to open a restaurant, Castillo, Senor Castillo said. He was right next to her and the sound of his voice, almost a whisper, made Isabel jump. When we were talking that first night, everybody was telling each other what they wanted to do when we got to the U.S., Senor Castillo went on. But I never said. I wanted to open a restaurant with my sons. Something sparkled on the dark horizon, and at first Isabel took it to be one of the stars in the white scar of the Milky Way twinkling in her watery eyes. But no, it was too bright, too orange. And there were others just like it, all clustered in a horizontal line, separating the black waters from the black sky. It was Miami, at last. Yvonne had just missed seeing Miami. Mahmoud, Macedonia to Serbia, 2015, 14 to 15 days from home. Mahmoud felt like he was back in Syria. Policemen with guns guarded the border from Greece into Macedonia, and he felt dirty again, unwanted, illegal. Even without travel papers, Mahmoud and his family had been able to exchange their Syrian pounds for euros and buy train tickets from Athens to Thessalonica. And there was a little Greek town near the border of Macedonia. Now they were headed for the Macedonian town of Gevgalija, where they hoped to catch a train north to Serbia and there, from there to Hungary, but first they had to find a way to sneak across the border. Mahmoud pointed out a little tangle of tents and laundry lines just off the gravel road, and Mahmoud's father pulled them into the camp to plan their next move. It was just another little refugee village, the kind of makeshift town Mahmoud had seen again and again on the, cro on the road out of Syria. Mahmoud and his father hunkered down behind a trash barrel and watched the border crossing. The Macedonian police weren't turning people away, but they might be checking papers, and Mahmoud's family had waited in Athens hadn't waited in Athens for official travel permits. Mahmoud's dad pulled out his iPhone and consulted the map. This whole area is farmland, his father said. Flatland, too easy to be caught. He scrolled sideways on the map and Mahmoud leaned in closer. It looks like there's a forest here to the west, dad said. They can't have every meter of the border guarded. We'll slip through at night. Once we're in Macedonia, we'll be all right. Where's your mother? Mahmoud looked up. Mom was where she always was, working her way through the tents, looking for Hana. Hannah wasn't there, though, and she wasn't at any of the other little cl clusters of refugee tents that passed as they hiked farther into the countryside. At some, place he'd, at some place he'd picked from the map on his iPhone, Mahmoud's father led them off a dirt road into a dark forest. It was late, well after midnight, and Mahmoud was weary from walking, but they still had two hours to walk to the Macedonian border. Walid raised his arms up to be carried, and Dad hefted up, him up against his shoulder. Mahmoud bristled. Walid, Walid was being a baby. He was too big to be carried. Mahmoud was tired too, but nobody was carrying him. They walked along in silence, their way lit only by the occasional glow of a phone screen as Dad checked their position. The forest was full of tall pine trees that crowded almost everything else out, and the ground was covered with brown pine needles that smelled like a car freshener. Somewhere in the forest, an owl screeched, and Mahmoud heard the scurrying of small animals. Every rustle made Mahmoud jump, every scuffle gave him goosebumps. He was a city boy, used to the lights and sounds of traffic. Here, every sound was like a gunshot in the unearthly dark and quiet. It terrified Mahmoud. At last, they emerged from the dark woods and found the train station. It was a small, two-story, mustard-colored building with a burgundy roof and rounded gables. It was also packed with people. Hundreds of people slept outside, using their backpacks and trash bags as pillows. They filled the train platform and the sidewalks in front of the station, and some even slept between the tracks. Plastic bottles and empty bags and discarded wrappers littered the ground. Mahmoud watched his father's shoulders sag. Mahmoud felt the same way, but then his father stood taller and hiked to lead up higher on his shoulder. Hey, at least we know we're on the right track, he said. He grinned at Mahmoud. The right track. Get it? Mahmoud got it. He just didn't think any of this was funny. No, nothing, his father said. Guess I need to train you better. Mahmoud still didn't laugh. He was too tired. Mahmoud's mother had already left them, stepping carefully among the sleeping refugees like a ghost, searching for Hana. The train station looks closed, Mahmoud's father told him. We'll have to find some place to sleep. We'll come back in the morning and see if we can buy tickets. They found a nearby hotel listed on TripAdvisor, and they collected Mahmoud's mother and set out for the inn on foot. Mahmoud couldn't wait to climb into a real bed. He felt like he could sleep for days. A car came up behind them, and this time Mahmoud didn't jump out in front of it, but it slowed down and stopped beside them anyway. 
You need taxi? The man said in broken Arabic. No, Mahmoud's father said. We're just going to the hotel. Hotel much money, the man said. You go to Serbia? I take you in taxi. 25 euros each. Mahmoud did the math. 100 euros was a lot of money, almost 24,000 Syrian pounds. But a taxi ride straight to Serbia without spending the night or longer in Macedonia? Mahmoud's parents huddled together and Mahmoud listened in. Train tickets were likely cheaper, and Mom worried about accepting a ride from a strange man in a country they didn't know. But Dad argued that there wasn't another train until at least tomorrow. There were already so many people waiting for the train at the station. We're all tired, and a taxi gets us closer to Germany. Sleeping on the ground doesn't, Mahmoud threw in. That's the deciding vote then, Dad said. We'll take the car. It was a good decision. Two hours and 100 euros later, they were at the Serbian border. It was still dark, but there were no border guards where the driver dropped them off. No roads, either. Mahmoud had slept a little in the car, but he felt like a zombie as he shambled with his family along the railroad tracks that would take them across the border from Macedonia to the nearest Serbian town. Since they were traveling, they were permitted to skip their early morning prayers. They staggered into a town just after sunup. Mahmoud thought that if he didn't lie down somewhere and sleep, he would pass out on his feet and fall flat on his face. But there were even more refugees at this train station than there had been in Macedonia, and here there were no tents and no hotel rooms. People slept on the platform of the station or outside in the fields. There were no toilets either, and no markets or restaurants. What little the local Serbs had, they were charging a fortune for. One man was selling water bottles for five euros apiece. A group of men sat around a power strip charging their phones as though they were huddled around a campfire. Mahmoud had seen scenes like this everywhere along the route from Athens to Germany. He and his family paused just long enough to recharge their own phones again, and then they were on the move once more. Mahmoud was so tired he wanted to cry. His father found them a bus to Belgrade, and Mahmoud was thankful for the few hours sleep, uncomfortable though they were. It was almost sundown when they arrived in the Serbian capital, but they still couldn't stop. The police they were there were raiding hotels for illegal refugees, so Dad found another taxi driver who promised to take them the two hours farther to the Hungarian border. Taxis were expensive, but so, so was trying to stay overnight in a city that didn't want you. The silver four-door Volkswagen was driven by a middle-aged, olive-skinned Serbian man with a neatly trimmed black beard. He promised to get them to Hungary and keep them away from the police for 30 euros apiece, more than it had cost them to cross all of Macedonia. It was a tight fit in the car, and Mahmoud, with his mother and his father, crammed into the back seat and with, and with Walid in his father's lap. This new driver seemed to find every rut and hole in the road and send them flying into each other, but none of that mattered to Mahmoud. He was asleep almost as soon as he closed his eyes, and he only woke again when he realized the car wasn't moving. Had it really been two hours already? He felt like he'd just gone to sleep. Mamu's eyelids fluttered, and he looked out the windows. He expected to see the lights of, Ser of the Ser Serbian border town, another tent city. Instead, they were stopped in the middle of a lonely stretch of highway surrounded by dark, empty fields. And the taxi driver was leaning over the back seat with a pistol aimed straight at them. Joseph, off the American coast, 1939, 21 days from home. Miami, they weren't even a day out of Havana, and already the St. Louis was passing the American city. It was so close you could see it from the ship without binoculars. Joseph and Ruthie hung over the rails like everyone else, pointing out hotels and houses and parks. Joseph saw highways and white square office buildings, skyscrapers, and hundreds of little boats at harbor. Why couldn't they just pull into Miami and dock there? Why wouldn't the United States just let them in? There was so much land that didn't have buildings on it, miles and miles of palm trees and swamp as far as the eyes could see. Joseph would take it. He'd live there. He'd live anywhere so long as it was away from the Nazis. An airplane circled the ship, its propeller buzzing like a hornet. Newspaper, photogra excuse me, newspaper photographers, one of the other passengers, guessed out loud. Joseph knew by now that the St. Louis was big news the world over. Newsreel camera crews had followed the ship out of Havana Harbor on little boats, yelling out the same question all the passengers had. Where would they land? Who would take the Jewish refugees? Would they end up back in Germany? That afternoon, a U.S. Coast Guard cutter cruised alongside the St. Louis, its officers watching them through binoculars. One of the other children guessed the cutter was there to protect them, to pick up anyone who jumped overboard. Joseph thought it was to make sure the St. Louis didn't steer for Miami. Some of the children, like Ruthie, still played games and swam in the pool, and they were close enough to America for some of the teenagers to pick up a New York Yankees game on their radios. But most of the adults walked around like they were at a funeral. The happy mood of the voyage to Cuba was gone forever. People spoke little and socialized less. The movie theater was deserted. Nobody went to the dance hall, except for Joseph's mother. For days, she had mourned Joseph's father had become Joseph's father by locking herself in their cabin. But with the announcement that the St. Louis was leaving Cuba, leaving without her husband, something in her flipped like a light switch. She cleaned herself up, put on makeup, did her hair, dumped the contents of her suitcase on her bed, put on her favorite party dress, and went straight to the dance hall. 
She'd been there ever since. Joseph's mother was dancing by herself when he went to find her. A paper moon and stars still hung over the ceiling, decorations left over from the party when they all thought they'd be leaving the ship for Cuba. Joseph's mother saw him in the doorway and hurried over to him. She pulled Joseph with her onto the dance floor. Dance with me, Joseph, she said. She took his hands in hers and led him on a waltz. We didn't pay for all those dance lessons for nothing. The dance lessons had been a lifetime ago, back before Hitler, back when his parents thought not Joseph would be going to dances as a teenager, not running from the Nazis. No, Joseph said. He was too old to dance with his mother, too embarrassed. And there were more important things to think about right now. What's going on, Mama? Why are you doing this? It's like you're happy Papa's gone. She twirled in his arms. Did I ever tell you why your name Joseph, she asked? Uh, no. You're named after my older brother. I didn't know you had a brother. Joseph's mother danced like her life depended on it. Joseph died in the Great War, my brother, Joseph, at the Battle of the Somme in France. Joseph didn't know what to say. His mother had never talked about her brother before. His uncle, he realized, he would have had an uncle. You can live life as a ghost, waiting for death to come, or you can dance, she told him. Do you understand? No, said Joseph. The song ended, and Joseph's mother took his face in both her hands. You look just like him, she said. Joseph didn't know what to say. I'm sorry for the interruption, the band leader said, but I've just been told there will be a special announcement in the ADX social hall. Joseph's mother pouted because the music had stopped, but Joseph knew it was worse than that. He couldn't have said why, but he was sure, deep down in the pit of his stomach, that this would be only bad news. The worst. His mother took his hand and squeezed it. Come on, she said with a smile. The social hall was already full when they got there. In the front of the room, under the giant portrait of Adolf Hitler, stood a committee of passengers who had been working with the captain on a solution to their problem. From the looks on their faces, they had not come up with one. When the head of the committee spoke, he confirmed all of Joseph's worst fears. The United States has refused us. We are heading back to Europe. The outburst was instantaneous. Cries, gasps, tears. Joseph cursed the first time he ever cursed in front of his mother. She didn't react at all, and it made Joseph feel both a little ashamed and a little bolder at the same time. You mean we're going back to Germany, someone yelled. Not necessarily, a committee member said, but we must remain calm. Calm, Joseph thought. Was the man insane? Calm? How can we stay calm? A man asked out loud, echoing Joseph's thoughts. The man's name was Posner. Joseph had seen him before on the ship. A lot of us were in concentration camps, Posner went on. His face was twisted in anger and he spat his words. We were released only on condition that we leave Germany immediately. For us to return means one thing, going back to those camps. That could be the future of every man, woman, and child on this ship. We will not die. We won't return. We will not die, the crowd chanted. Out of the corner of his eye, Joseph saw Otto Schindick lingering in the doorway. Schindick grinned at the panic in the room, and Joseph felt his blood beginning to boil. Ladies and gentlemen, said the head of the committee, the news is bad, that we all realize, but Europe is still many days away. That gives us and all our friends time to make new attempts to help us. Joseph's mother pulled him away. Come, Joseph, somebody will think of something. Let's dance. Joseph suddenly didn't understand why his mother wasn't upset. Why she suddenly didn't seem to care anymore. They were about to be taken back to Germany, back to their deaths. Joseph let his mother pull him to the door, then broke away. No, Mama, I can't. She smiled sadly at him and ducked past Otto Schindig, who leaned against the door frame. You should do as your mother says, boy, Schindig said. These are your last free days. Enjoy them. When you go back to Hamburg, nobody will ever hear from you again. Joseph went back to the yelling passengers, his anger rising like the tide. There had to be something they could do, something he could do. The passenger who'd spoken up, Posner, pulled him aside. You're Aaron Landau's son, Joseph. Yes, I'm sorry about your father, he said. Joseph was tired of hearing people's condolences. Yes, thank you, he said, trying to move on. The man grabbed his arm. You were among the children who went to the engine room and the bridge, yes? Joseph frowned. What was this about? And you're a man now. You had your bar mitzvah, that first Shabbos on the ship. Joseph stood taller, and the man let go of his arm. What of it, Joseph asked. The man looked around to make sure nobody else was listening. There's a group of us who are going to try to storm the bridge and take hostages, he whispered. Force the captain to run the ship aground on the American coast. Joseph couldn't believe what he was hearing. He shook his head. It'll never work, Joseph said. He'd seen how many crew there really were on this ship and what a lot of them below decks really thought about the Jews. They wouldn't go down without a fight, and they knew this ship better than any passenger. Passenger shrugged. What choice do we have? We can't go back. Your father knew that. That's why he did what he did. If we succeed, we're free. If we fail, at least the world will realize how desperate we are. Joseph looked to the floor. If they failed, when they failed, the captain would take the ship back to Germany, and then Posner and the rest of the hijackers were sure to be sent to concentration camps. Why are you telling me this, Joseph asked. Because we need you with us, Posner told him. We need you to show us the way up to the bridge. 
Isabel, off the coast of Florida, 1994, five days from home, Miami. It was like a dream, like a glittering vision of heaven, as if Yvonne had opened the gates for them. Everyone stared, stunned, as though they had never thought they would actually see it. When the lights on the horizon became the faint shapes of buildings and roads and trees, they knew for sure they were looking at Miami, and they cried and hugged each other again. Isabel cried again for Yvonne, cried because he had been so close and hadn't made it. But her tears for him were mixed with relief that she would make it to the States, and that made her feel guilty and cry even harder. How could she be sad for Yvonne and happy for herself at the same time? Crunk. Something bent and broke under Poppy's foot, and the boat lurched. Water streamed in from a new crack in the hole, and suddenly all feelings of relief ended. The boat was sinking. No, Poppy cried. He, drove, he dove to try to shore up the hole, but there was nothing he could do. The weight of the ship and its passengers were pulling it apart at last. They all scrambled to the front of the boat, but the back end sank deeper and deeper under the weight of the heavy engine. The top of the hole was almost to the waterline at the back. When the two met, the ocean would flood in over the side and there would be no going back. They would drown, or end up like Yvonne. Tara rose in Isabel like the water filling the boat. She couldn't drown, couldn't disappear beneath the waves like Lita, like Yvonne. No, no. Bail, her grandfather cried. Miami was lying on the prow of the boat as far away from the rising water as possible, her breath coming harder and shorter now. But everyone else dove for their cups and jugs. It wasn't going to be enough, though. Isabel could see that. There was too much water, too much weight. The engine. Isabel suddenly remembered the way it had been working itself loose from its bolts. She threw herself at it, trying to knock it loose. When she couldn't wrench it free by hand, she wedged herself in between it and the next bench, down in the water, and kicked at it with her feet. Chabella, leave the engine alone and help us bail, her father called. Isabel ignored him and kicked. If she could just get the engine free... Another foot joined hers. Amara, she understood. Together they kicked at the engine until Isabel finally felt the wet wood around the bolts give. The engine tumbled to the bottom of the boat, covering up Fidel Castro's commandment to them. Fight, fight against the impossible and win, Isabel thought. One, two, three, Amara said. Together she and Isabel rolled the motorcycle engine up the side and almost over until Isabel slipped and it rolled back with a splash into the water inside the boat. Again, Amara told her, one, two, three. Up, 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 they rolled the engine and onto the top of the side where it pushed the hole down below the surface of the sea. Water gushed in and Isabel felt the boat sinking under her feet, pulling her with it down into the black depths, down with Yvonne and the sharks. Wait, Senor Castillo cried. And with one last good push, Isabel and Amara tipped the engine over the side. It slipped into the water with a slurp and dropped like a stone and the back end of the boat shot up out of the water, the weight of the engine no longer dragging it down. What have you done, Senor Castillo cried. Now we'll never make it to shore. We weren't going to make it if we sank, Amara told him. We'll row, Lita said. When we're close enough in, the tide will take us the rest of the way. Or we'll swim. Swim, Isabel worried. With the sharks? Just bail or we won't be doing anything, Luis cried. Bail. Beep, beep. An electronic siren made them all jump, and a red swirling light came on a few hundred meters to their left. A person speaking English said something over a bullhorn. Isabel didn't understand. From the confused looks on everyone's faces in the boat, they didn't either. Then the same message, then the same voice repeated the message in Spanish. Halt! This is the United States Coast Guard. You are in violation of U.S. waters. Remain where you are and prepare to be boarded. Mahmoud, Serbia to Hungary, 2015, 15 to 16 days from home. Mahmoud stared at the gun pointed at him. Was this real or was he still asleep and having a nightmare? The Serbian taxi driver waved the pistol at, Mahmo at Mahmoud's family. You pay 300 euros, he demanded. This wasn't a dream. It was real. Mahmoud had been groggy just seconds before, but now he was wide awake, his heart hammering. His eyes felt dry, even though his shirt still clung to him with sleep sweat, and he blinked rapidly as he looked at his parents. They were already awake, his father hugging the still sleeping Walid protectively. Don't shoot, please, Mahmoud's father said. He threw one of his arms protectively against Mahmoud and his mother. 300 euros, the taxi driver said. 300 euros? That was more than twice what they had agreed to pay the driver. Please, Dad begged. You not die, you pay 300, the taxi driver yelled. His arms shook and the gun danced between the two front seats. Mahmoud's mother closed her eyes and shrank away. Mahmoud's father threw up his hand. We'll pay, we'll pay. They were being held at gunpoint in the middle of nowhere in a foreign country. What else could he do? Mahmoud's heart thundered in his chest as his father handed Walid to Mum and fumbled with the money hidden inside his shirt under his belt. Mahmoud wanted to do something, to stop this man from threatening his family. But what could he do? Mahmoud was helpless, and that made him even madder. With shaking hands, Mahmoud's father counted out 300 euros and shoved them at the taxi driver. Why he didn't demand the whole stash of money, Mahmoud didn't understand. You get out! Get out, the taxi driver said. Mahmoud and his family didn't have to be told twice. They threw open the car doors and scrambled outside, and before the doors were even fully closed 
Again, the Volkswagen tore off down the dark road, its red taillights disappearing around a, a curve. Mahmoud trembled with anger and fear, and his mother shook with quiet sobs. Mahmoud's father pulled them all into a hug. Well, Mahmoud's father said at last, I'm definitely giving that driver a bad review on TripAdvisor. Mahmoud's quivering legs gave out, and he sank to the ground. Tears streamed down his face, as though they'd been held back by a dam before, and now the floodgates had suddenly been opened. He'd had a gun pointed right at his face. As long as he lived, Mahmoud would never forget that feeling of paralyzing terror, of powerlessness. His mother sat down in the road with him and hugged him. Mahmoud's tears came harder, fueled by everything that had come before, the bombing of their house, the attack on their car, struggling to live in Izmir, the long hours in the sea, and of course, Hana, mostly Hana. I'm so sorry, Mom, Mahmoud blubbered. I'm so sorry I mean to give Hana away. His mother stroked Mahmoud's hair and shook her head. No, my beautiful boy. If the boat hadn't come along when it did, if you hadn't convinced them to take her, she would have drowned. I couldn't keep us above water. You saved her. I know you did. She's out there somewhere. We just have to find her. Mahmoud nodded into his mother's shoulder. I'll find her again, Mom, I promise. Mahmoud and his mother cried and held each other until Mahmoud remembered they weren't getting any closer to Hana or to Germany. He dragged his sleeve across his wet mountain thin nose and his mother kissed him on the forehead. That thief took us about halfway to Hungary, at least, Mahmoud's father said, looking at his phone. We're on a back road about an hour's drive from the border. I think we're close to a bus stop. It means we have to walk again, though. Mahmoud helped his mother stand, and his father hefted Walid up higher on his shoulder. Mahmoud's little brother had slept through the whole thing. Mahmoud worried again about his brother. Air raids, shootouts, taxi holdups, nothing seemed to faze him anymore. Was he just keeping all his tears and screams pent up inside, or was he becoming so used to horrible things happening all around him that he didn't notice anymore, didn't care? Would he come to life again when they got to Germany, if they ever got to Germany? They made it to the bus stop in time to catch the late bus to Horgos, a Serbian city on the Hungarian border. Even more Syrian refugees had collected there, but no one was getting through. Not by boat or rail, or even out in the countryside the way Mahmoud and his family had crossed into Macedonia and Serbia. The Hungarians had a fence. It wasn't finished yet, but even now at night, Hungarian soldiers were hard at work, driving four-meter-tall metal poles into the ground along the border and stretching chain-link fencing between them. Once the fence was hung, another group came behind them and attached three tiers of razor wire coil to it to keep people from climbing over. The Hungarians were closing their border. But we don't even want to go to Hungary, Mahmoud said. We just want to go through to Austria. The Hungarians don't care, I guess, Dad said. They don't want us in their country, whether we're coming or going. A group of refugees suddenly rushed a part of the unfinished fence, trying to get through it before it was done. We're not terrorists, somebody cried. We're just refugees. We just want to get through to Germany. They'll take us, someone else cried. There were more shouts and screams, and before Mahmoud knew what was happening, he and his family were caught in the press of refugees trying to get across the border. Mahmoud was jostled from every side. He clung to the back of his father's shirt, hanging on like Dad was a life preserver, and they were going over a waterfall. As frightening as the stampede was, Mahmoud was excited, too. The refugees were finally doing something. They weren't just disappearing into their tent cities. They were standing up and saying, here we are, look at us, help us. But the Hungarian soldiers weren't interested in helping. As the refugees swarmed the border, soldiers in blue uniforms with red berets and red armbands hurried to stop them, firing tear gas canisters into the crowd. One of the canisters exploded near Mahmoud with a bang and people screamed as a gray white cloud erupted all around them. Mahmoud's eyes burned like someone had sprayed hot pepper juice in them and mucus poured from his nose. He choked on the gas and his lungs seized up. He couldn't breathe. It felt like he was drowning on land. He fell to his knees, clutching at his chest and gasping uselessly for air. I'm going to die, Mahmoud thought. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die.